My name is P.H. Copeland. Um, I identify as a pan-African cisgender woman. I'm from North Minneapolis. I'm a Christian, and I currently live in St. Paul. I cross the river. Yes, please don't throw uh, rocks at me through the sound waves. And I do organizing for a profession because my heart is called to be a part of the community and to do what I can in order to make sure that people are having healthy and thriving lives and getting the resources that they need to make that happen. Well, thanks, Paige, for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Levi. Yeah. Well, and I also want to just, like, additional context add that I have spent roughly the last eight months growing and learning under your co-facilitation around organizing <laughs> and justice work. So uh, I would really love to hear your thoughts on Well, this that. is just a chance for me to say, like, <laughs> thank you for that. I mean, I, I know I've gotten a lot of growth and a lot of development and built a lot of relationships in in that framework. And that is, you're a big part of that. So I Aww, just want to sort of you, acknowledge Levi. that piece as well. I thought I scared you for the first couple of months. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's helpful because yours is a, an aggressive welcoming. <laughs> Welcome, y'all! Like, yeah, that I like that. Like, I, I, one of my favorite things is like, I don't really have to wonder where I sit when I'm with you. Like, you are pretty upfront about like, yes, come on in, or please leave me alone. Like, I prefer that to the, like, Midwestern, like, are we best friends or do you hate me right now? Oh, gosh. I totally you are like, my face. I'm either blowing bubbles and we're all playing, I have or I want to punch you in the face. Like, well, those are your options. Let's be real. I love it. I, I've been trying to work on my facial expressions yeah. and not holding my emotions there, but I, I, I can't help it. I grew up this way. And that's probably a good thing. But at the same time, when I'm really pissed off and trying to navigate in my head of what my next action is, it shows so easily. And that can sometimes create some conflict and tension in the space. Yeah, I can imagine there's risk for you. <clears throat> like, it's great that you have, you know, I think we're all trying to not be deceptive. Or not all of us. But the yeah. goal is to sort of be truthful in our actions and our words. And the fact that your face won't let you not. <laughs> can be like a great internal accountability tool, <laughs> but it also probably means you can't sometimes be like, I'm supposed to stay neutral right now, and I'll go process these feelings later. <laughs> like that is also a tool you need, especially when you're organizing and like yes. leading folks. Especially with youth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> they know anyway. It's yeah, like, they you do. You can be great at hiding it. I just let them know. This is what's going on. I can't go there with you right this moment. <laughs> we'll come and revisit this later. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about a number of things. I mean, I yeah. feel like because of the work you do and also because of the community that you're a part of now and where you come from, you are able to speak to a lot of different areas that people probably have a lot of misunderstandings mm -hmm. around. And so uh, you, you mentioned something that I want to ask you about. I think that will sort of help us get into a conversation. I think it was the... Uh, I'm trying to think of what the word is, but that qualifier that someone puts on a compliment or um, just even like feedback about the way you did something, the way you look. You gave a specific example, and I would love it if you yeah. kind of retold that. But I think it, it gets at a larger issue of the way someone tells somebody something and this need to couch it in something that sort of <laughs> dissolves whatever meaning it has. Yep. <laughs> We all have done that too. So sure. I was at SA um, down the street from my house and I was like feeling really good. So I was like, I'm going to put some, I'm going to put my head wrap on, put my makeup on, I'm going to put my, my black lipstick and I'm about that life this morning. I just needed some extra oomph. And so I'm outside getting gas into my car, got some cash and this guy, uh, older black man, I was like, please don't hit on me, please don't hit on me. But he, you can just always tell when someone's going about to ask the question or about to stay in line. Anyways, he was like, you're such a voluptuous woman. Like, you're just looking good. And what did he say? You're beautiful and you're confident. I wish my, my wife could see your confidence. Um, you're just, I want her to know that uh, she can be beautiful and strong for a big girl because you're just so beautiful. And he just kept going. And, and I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna take these nuggets for what they are. Like you said, I was beautiful. Thank you. I needed that extra power this morning. You said that you know I have confidence, and that you wish that your wife had the same confidence and could see that. But then yet you just lessened all of that by adding for a big girl. Yeah. And it's, it was something, <laughs> and it, and like my my weight has been something that I wrestle with all my life. 
I come from a family that struggles with weight, with hypertension, with heart disease, with obesity, with all these things, right? Um, and so it's just a part of my life and the struggle that I just kind of inherited. And I don't go a day without thinking about my weight. Almost like I don't go a day without thinking about being black. I don't go a day without thinking about being a woman from North Minneapolis. Like those things I cannot take off. And so I've been on this journey about really accepting who I am and all parts of me. And so when a compliment is said, even though like their intention really is just a straight compliment or whatever it may be, and have the qualifier for a blank, it just kind of another stab at all that work you've been doing yeah, yeah. <laughs> over the course of your life of knowing who you are and who you're wanting to be. But then it's like, I'm just me. <laughs> I wish you can just see that and accept that. Yeah. Um, and I'm a human, so like really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wonder if you can dig in a little bit to either why do you think people do that or if you're able to unpack a little bit of what what that actually does. Because I, I think that it could easily be something people would say. I mean, even you were able just now to go, like, I took the parts I needed and was able to sort of work past the stuff that wasn't great. Yeah. Via Facebook. But we, <laughs> <laughs> right. You had some help processing. Um, but... We do do a thing of minimizing hurtful things sometimes. And some of it's just survival. Yeah. But it also sometimes means that stuff gets to keep going. Like, I certainly would not make the case that you need to be calling people out and like, you're doing enough fighting. You don't need to like yeah. gas station tell people like, <laughs> here's where your language is problematic. Like I'm sure you do do that sometimes because <laughs> yes. I know you, but that is a lot of work. But I, I'm curious, if you can articulate how that isn't just a small thing, like that, it, it, is it more than just, okay, no big deal, the guy said for a big girl? What, is it, what does that really matter? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a couple couple things of why people do that. I know I've been guilty of uh, trying to say a compliment, but I had a qualifier. Yeah. For mine, it's always for a white man. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are a white what man. Take? <laughs> can, you, can you dance? Can you jump? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the um, reason why we add qualifiers is because I we want to really, we want to do our best to let the other person know that we see them, um, regardless if we know who they are and how they identify. There's some things that you really can see, so you can see you can see race, you can see color, you can see someone's size, um, you may see be able to see certain abilities. And if we're socialized to understand that certain individuals or certain communities have more struggle than the other because of whiteness, supremacy, where we are living and how we've been, um, the information we've been fed in, we want to go the extra mile. And so we want to let them know that we see them, that we may have an understanding of their struggle, maybe from personal experience, because we ha may have a parent or a sibling or have gone, gone through it themselves. And so I almost want to say, I see you, like the big sign, mm -hmm. right? And we don't think, we don't think what that, what those words could be doing on the receiving end. Yeah. And so I really want to with you know take their best intention as just that. But it doesn't make it one hurt any less. Yeah. Doesn't make it sound any less incorrect um, and it doesn't make it stay with you. I also think that part of it going back to the not thinking before we speak. Some of us really just don't have filters. <laughs> Some of us have not developed filters, yeah. um, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. And I think that sometimes there, we don't have folks, some folks don't have individuals in their lives to kind of walk with them on that journey of like what it means to really engage with community mm -hmm. and to say what you mean and be able to add some cushion to it if need be. There's been some times in my life in which I've had white friends that would be, they'd be told, this is my intention, right? But they say some things in which I have to pull them aside, but like, so what did you really mean by that statement? And walk with them through that journey of unpacking that statement. And often the first thing that is said is, well, that was not, that's not what I meant. Mm -hmm. and, they get, and they go into uh, apologizing and trying to make another personal connection to it. And then try to make it really about them and not about the other person in that situation. And then going further of saying, okay, I'm taking ownership of my action, my words, and try to figure out how to go about that in a different way later on. I mean, I'd be trying to correct it in that moment because sometimes you don't have the opportunity to go and apologize because one, if you 
do that, that person may not take it uh, take it very well. Uh, you make a hit. <laughs> Or you make it the eye rolls of, yeah, mm mm-hmm, okay. But it may be often it's just for the next time Hmm. of being able to understand that you can say that statement, you can make that compliment, you can say what you want to say, but not everything is meant to be said. Or that there's some other things behind um, what you may be seeing that may not be correct. Yeah. Man, you said so many things that I want to, like, grab onto. Because I think that recentering that you talked about, that oh, uh, it's not what I meant, I'm so sorry, here's where I was coming from, which is that sort of bringing it back to making it about you again, yep. which is so heavily built into, uh, I think fragility is a description of it, <laughs> because it is a, yeah. oh, no, I feel suddenly, like, uh, vulnerable because I did something wrong, mm-hmm. and I want that feeling to go away immediately, and it's, like, such a gut reaction that does deny the other person's experience, and I think yeah. it stops you from learning, Yeah, but it's a, I think it's a really hard skill to work on, yeah, uh, which like, which means you should do that hard work. I think people yeah. hear like, well, it's so hard, so forget it. But really, I think maybe <laughs> me, the answer is it's so hard. So there you go. There's your assignment. Right? It's like me trying to, you know, m- m- uh, meet my my weight goal, and I'm like, it's so hard. I'm gonna stop right now and pick up this, this bag of chips and continue watching Netflix. Like, yeah. it really is difficult. Yeah. But like, if you're looking for a certain result, right. And you really are trying to work on yourself. You have to do that work, and that looks differently for everyone. I wonder <clears throat> if you can talk a little bit. I want to come back to another thing you mentioned too, but if you can talk a little bit about the importance of just having that uncomfortable thing happen. Someone tells you, you know, what was your intention with those words? This is how they landed, mm-hmm. and not trying to clean it up, and then just leaving that experience without having resolved it. Yeah. Can you talk about? the role of that in the learning and the growth? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question, Levi. Um, you, you have big answers. Because <laughs> I'm a big girl. No, I'm joking. No. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm the bad guy. I don't know what happened. He's blindsided me. <laughs> oh, I love me. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I do everything in community. And my community is very big and and it looks very different at at every every, at every moment but that's kind of the lens that i i view a lot of things through aside from my identity um is what is my role right now in this community and what's going to be the best way i can leave it well better than what i first entered it Mm. um it's like a camping rule it really is (laughs) leave it better than what you (laughs) found it and sometimes we feel as if it's not our, our job to make it any better. I'm just going to take what I can get, right? I'm going to go camping, and I love camping. I'm going to go camping and have my good time, but I'm, just, I'm not going to do anything but the bare minimal. Yeah. But I believe that what happens when we do more than the bare minimum is that we are allowing growth to happen, uh, and we're allowing someone else to have a better experience, and we're allowing for them to grow in their own way. And so I kind of take that model and apply that to the work that I do. And so the situation of like cleaning up that that situation with the individual at SA, one, I didn't have time to go there with him because I didn't want him to feel as if I w- was sexually interested. Oh, yeah. Because I'm still, you know, that, you know, how you can sometimes feel someone about to approach you, like, hey, well, how you doing? I'm not trying to go there, right? And so it's kind of like my, my defense mode. But then it's also understanding that some of the words that I may have wanted to say would almost make it really hard for him to hear. I don't always know how people are going to take certain messages or engage with my words. It's not my job often, but part of me, you know, have issues of codependency, um, <laughs> is trying to navigate that and do more for that person. Um, and I'm still working on that. Mm. Because um, there's a lot of goodness baked into that codependency, right? Like you get the yeah. feedback of having helped. Yeah. Even if it ultimately is hurtful. <laughs> exactly. And then I'll, and I'll often put myself in that, not in a good situation, yeah. right? But then it's also understanding, sorry, I'm kind of going in a whole different direction with this. That's all right. But, this is good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. If you need validation from me, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you, white man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Levi. Um, Terrible. <laughs> I feel myself growing right now. <laughs> But it's also understanding that I can do, within that community and with the words that we use, I can take that in a very different way and help someone else grow. And so what I decided to do was to uh, help 
other folks navigate my situation on social media. Mm -hmm. And so, and I did it in a very roundabout way and I, and it, and not necessarily hoping to have conversation because I think sometimes social media is really good for just saying, this is my experience. Don't do this next time and just drop it. Right. Cause I think often people are just looking for those, those quick antidotes. And it happens through stories. And so I just said, you know, quickly, I share what, what happened. I said, N- next time, just say, I'm beautiful, I'm powerful, and that I wish that uh, my wife could see your confidence. Mm. And just leave off the last part for a big girl. Yeah, I'm going to take these nuggets and keep going. And what I ended up having was folks in my life saying, yes, and like, and don't you, I just hate when that happens. And like, oh, I never really thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. And that's how I'm able to make my community one that I'm really invested in better um, and hope that maybe someone in their life could do the same thing for them and be able to go there with them. But this, And there's also this thing of not wanting to go and continue that conversation with the individual that said the remarks to me because there's, there's a generational difference. Mm-hmm. There's a gener- gener- generational gap. He, you know, can be seen as my elder. He is my elder. Um, and so in the black community, like you hold your elders to a really high esteem, regardless if they deserve it or not. Some of that can be sticky waters. But having um, many older uncles, right, different generation, that in their, in their way of giving compliments, I, under- I can understand like why he did what he did. Because that's just how they grew up, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, you, you see a nice woman or you see someone that it's something that's really interesting to you and you want to give them some power, you just you just let it out, right? But I think now we're in a, a different different generation in which we're not hyper, we're, we're alert and we understand the impact of words in a much different, in a much different way. Yeah. And I also have been, I, I do organizing and so I'm over, I'm like overly you know, vigilant of things. Yeah. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. It just is. And so I'm like navigating all of that at the same time, which can be tiring, but understanding that I can't fix everything. That's not my job. Some experiences are meant for learning for yourself as well as for them. And knowing what you need, what I need in order to keep moving on for me to be healthy mm-hmm. and understanding what I kind of, what I said earlier of me being on the shooting for a really long time and that it's taken a lot for me to really be firm in my identities and me loving myself that I'm going to leave off, I'm going to, you know, spit out the bones and just take the meat and just assume best intention on their behalf. Yeah. Another thing you got into earlier, and I think touched on it even still, is this idea of we, in the desire to be empathetic or as informing our empathy, we assume the struggles of other people. Mm. And so this gentleman assumed you are a big girl, so you've probably struggled with your weight. So I want to make sure I acknowledge, hey, I know you struggle with that, and it's amazing how well you're doing. You are a, a black person, and I think there's probably been a lot of experiences when someone assumes that you've struggled with the way society treats black people. So they bring that into that, and mm-hmm. you're a woman, and society is not super big fans of women. <laughs> yeah. But I don't need to say, hey, you're doing a great job for a woman. But I think there is built into all those things this assumption of struggle. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if you can talk about that maybe those things are all true. Like maybe those are all areas mm-hmm. where you do have to fight for survival daily. But what does it do to be overtly reminded of those components of yourself when someone is trying to even be kind towards you or trying to call you out in a good way? Hmm. That like maybe you, you don't need reminders of your struggles, but it seems like it must be, I don't know if that is the sort of the microaggression thing or what that Right. What that is, but it feels like it's it's a mechanism that is built into the way we talk to each other, and it comes from a place of wanting to do good, mm-hmm. but ultimately it does harm. Am I making sense from a question standpoint? Yeah, sort of. I'm trying to figure out what this thing is, that, and it and is it something that you do feel like you deal with all the time, just because? I'm how to deal with the assumptions of who I am and the struggles that I deal with. Yeah. Do are, do you do you like, like are you directly feeling that from people that they are assuming? these various sort of big bucket struggles in your life? All the time. I mean, as soon as I say, I'm from North Minneapolis, mm. and let's just say, if, if I had not said that I'm a, I'm a Pan-African black woman, right? Yeah. To you, you probably would assume that I was white 
Hmm. I, I understand that. I get that all the time. In fact, I was at an organizing call um, with someone and we were organizing via the phone and we never met in person and we met for coffee and they were like, oh my gosh, I did not think that you were, I didn't know it was you. I didn't know you were black. Thank God you're black because I, and I'm like, nope, I'm black. It's me. <laughs> Full J. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I say that I'm from North Minneapolis, and we know that there's all kinds of there's news st stories, and there's articles, and there's just all this negative attention on my community. And I'm like, but I know it to be such a beautiful community, one that's filled with all sorts of wealth and power. But yeah, it's, it's just this it's, it's this assumption of I know, I see who you are, um, I've heard something about who you are, and therefore I automatically attach it to struggle or certain things that, so therefore I have some kind of connection. But often we don't have a connection unless we have personal experiences there. So what does it mean to kind of really support the individual and, and be in community with them? I knew with this, with this guy, with this individual that made the comment to me that yeah, you live in my ears. So I may see you again, but you're not really there to want to build something together, right? Yeah. So for myself, I, I look at what are the future engagements that we'll have for me to know how would I want to engage in that conversation in that moment, uh, regardless if you have an assumption of my struggle or not. I'm not sure if I'm a answering No, I question. like that. You made me think of something I, uh, I'm curious about. People hear you on the phone and assume that you're white. I think is that uh, is that because of the way you talk, or what is the because I you talk about what's happening there. I sound so eloquent. I I enunciate very well. And that's a so that's what I want to hear about. Articulate. Is, I want. <laughs> We're getting to all the microaggressions. Yes, well, <laughs> microaggressions too. But I want to know because that seems like that must come from a, a sort of a series of assumptions about white folks, yes. and black folks, and articulation and intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think about that thing that people are even aware of how you speak? I imagine you get that in a bunch of different kinds of ways, mm -hmm. like people who say you sound white and that's people of color saying that. And what are they mm -hmm. getting at? And then mm -hmm. people who are talking to you and they like think you're white and maybe they can say something shitty to you because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're like, oh, we're fine. No one's going to find out I'm a monster right now. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, what is that like? And I don't know. Can you talk a bit about that sort of? I'm art, you're an articulate person of color. Like what? Yeah, what's happening there. <laughs> yeah. So that to me, it sounds it 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 it, uh, tack, it attaches a type of privilege hmm. onto my existence because of the way that I sound. But in all reality, like I grew up in North Minneapolis. My my parents are black. My grandparents are black. I grew up in a black community, and we all sound very different. But they just kind of assume they assume that I went to I grew up in the suburbs. That my parents are wealthy. That we <laughs> went to private school. Even though I went to Ascension for like two years, which is primarily black students, black Latino students, and that we have power. Then they were like, okay, well, you're black, so then maybe you went to boarding school, or maybe you were sent off, and so therefore you were, you know, developed to be something else. No, we were we were a poor family, still am, right? And so I would say that we are kind of in like in the black and black community, like we have like this whole thing of the lighter you are, the better it is. Like the, the closer to whiteness you are, the, the better experiences you will have, the more power you will have, the less you will have to deal with negativity and racism and, and whatnot, fill in the blank. And it comes down to us having such a high value on white people and white culture. And that that is the ultimate thing that you must obtain in order to have a healthy, stable, successful life. In order for that to be acquired, you have to deny a lot of who you are. Hmm. And so is the being articulate, is that perceived as you're denying something? Just in yeah. having that articulation? Yeah, they're like, well, why did you all of a sudden start just talking like this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't have an answer for you. This is just how I've always talked. So when I was uh, working, um, I was a youth organizer with Freedom School, which was a component of People's Institute North for Survival and Beyond. And we were youth organizers kind of helping, we were doing stuff around the state, talking about racism and gaining the language of what this is, the system is, right? So we were like telling people that they're racist and like the, the system is oppressive. We got to dismantle shit, like, right? Can I say shit? Yeah. Shit, shit, shit. Yeah. Okay. We're talking about <laughs> systematic 
<laughs> talking about white supremacy, so I don't know if we can filter out shit. <laughs> and so I was having this moment with um, with my with my peers and our youth worker was in the room, and I was talking. I was having like this moment of deep sadness and grief, and I was talking about how I really, like, I, I am a part of the community and, like, how I love my people and, like, I'm black and that I I matter and that, like, I don't understand, like, why I just can't be accepted. Like, yeah, I went to Washburn High School. That was a choice that I made so I could understand more of my community. But it wasn't to leave North Minneapolis. And this eighth grader, I mean, I was, like, a junior at the time. And this eighth grader is so wise. She said, have you ever thought that the reason why people call you white is because they're pushing you away because they're afraid that you're going to take all the wealth and the knowledge that you have developed from being here and never come back? Mm. And I didn't have any words. I was just like, but in my heart, in my head, I'm thinking, I will never do that. I can't do that because my heart is here. But there was a lot of truth to that. Because within our community, there's been so many, like there's been experiences of folks like growing up here and like doing great work and and having amazing experiences and then like taking that and going somewhere else and helping someone else's community and not really investing here, investing in home. We, there's so many, there's so much people coming in trying to say, I'm gonna help you out, but then like leave, right? There's really not much of that deeper investment um, that was being seen. And, and people are doing the best that they can. There are a lot of folks that are really investing in North Minneapolis and within our communities. But there's still that fear of folks leaving. Because that's been seen a lot. It's been seen, it's been experienced. And like, for myself, I, I totally understood that. I had people in my life like say, oh yeah, I'm here, but they're not really here. Hmm. And so actually that's why like I went to college in North, upstate New York and I came back because my heart is here, and I wanted to make sure that she knew that I was I was for real. So I think I'm still like trying to make up, uh, improve myself, improve that I'm not like the like not like others that have done that in the past. Well, um, I am curious. I mean, I mean, some of it is just my heart is here. Like I think that's really powerful. But you you have a ton of hustle, and <laughs> that, that's a good thing. Um, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> but but I think what something you're talking about is. People who have that, have that ambition, can put it in a lot of places. Yeah. And sometimes it is like, I need to go get some financial stability because I have not felt that. And that is exhausting and terrifying. Yeah. And so there is some degree of like, can't fault someone for just wanting to go feel safe. And right. I don't think you are. Right. But <clears throat> what I see from you is like taking your ambition and pouring it into investing in the people that have been in your lives always and the mm -hmm. communities that have always been a part of you to the point where you still have to scrounge and struggle to stay afloat yourself like just to keep yeah. yourself in order like i you know I, I don't see you like in a bad way like hitting people up for money every time you see them or anything like that which <laughs> I, you know whatever i wouldn't judge you if that was the case <laughs> but, but i do know like you are not doing everything you're doing to get paid you're not right. most of your choices it seems are not just about taking care of ph i think probably you're you're working to make sure you're not not taking your PH, so right. like that's part of your sort of journey. Right, right and that's now. been a struggle as well, right? Because yeah. I, as an organizer, as doing community work and being investing and investing, you do everything that you possibly can, right? And that's how and and you're not being selfish because you're just keep giving, keep right. giving, keep giving. But if you're keep giving but not really giving to yourself first, that you're not really being selfless. Right, it feels like you're you're killing yourself to fight for survival, which doesn't make any right, sense. Right, right, and there and there's balance, and like it's a it's a it's a journey, it's a progress. You don't always do it right the first time or the tenth time. Like what is a process? Like we're on the journey. Yeah, but I wanted reason. to know if you could talk about. I mean, that's choices. You're making choices every day to stay in this community building work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make that choice. No, so but... Can you talk... I mean, I know you feel like... But you have to. Like, I get there's that. But I wonder if you can talk about, like, how aware and when you had awareness of, like, oh, I have some paths, but I need to, I need to go back to home and stay home, and that's where I need to be invested. Like, has that been a, a decision or a question you've wrestled with? All the time. 
No, I mean, like, I knew I was always going to come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was only four years. That was, like, my abroad experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I kid you not. People were like, New York. Have, you, went to, you went to upstate New York. What was that like? Did you, did you participate in abroad ex- experiences? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm in upstate New York. There's nothing but white folk and deer. Like, let's just be real about this for a second. <laughs> this is abroad. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're on a lake. I, I love you, Wells. Elk River uh, or wherever, <laughs> too. <laughs> it's a beautiful school, beautiful campus. But, like, to come back home, I felt as if, like, the only thing that I could really do was to come back home. Mm. But now that I've, you know, I've, I've come back, it's been, what, over seven years that I've completed college and still trying to figure out what does it really mean to be here. I was doing youth development like, <laughs> when I got back from school. I became assistant director of a camp, and I loved the camp. I was able to um, work with children and youth of color that were coming from very similar backgrounds and experiences as I, um, but from St. Paul. And I was just able to be with them. It was amazing. And as, as well as be able to develop staffers and uh, junior counselors and programs, like that was just life-giving. Granted, it doesn't come with some pains and some sorrow, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about what it meant to be me, utilizing my faith as a, as a vehicle for organizing and just being with people and understanding that like not every, <laughs> that your belief system isn't just like this line that never moves right? Like we develop as people. And so that was kind of like me be starting to be understand that it's not going to look the way I thought it was going to look and that I have to be flexible because there's a lot of experiences, a lot of things I have to learn as an adult that I never had exposure to. I also began understanding that being an adult is hard. Adulting is... <laughs> Hard. Yeah. Um, it's a real bummer sometimes. It really is. But then struggling while I was there, I was saying, like, I, I want to go back to North Minneapolis. I want to go back. I want to move back. I want to live there. But it took me until, what, last year to finally live back in North Minneapolis? Mm-hmm. And I was only there for four or five months. Yeah. I think I was kind of experiencing a little bit of what <laughs> folks experience when, when they move from out of state, never being from here, of, like, re-entering in. Yeah. Or entering in and building relationship in, in community. A little standoffish. A little very, bit. very. And like building your network. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and it's interesting because at our last speak training, mm-hmm. um, something came up of what, is, what does it mean to grieve a home or grieve something that you never had experience with mm-hmm. or exposure to? Yeah. And what does it mean to return home to do work? understanding that your path, your journey may take you in many different ways. I haven't figured it out yet, honestly. I don't think I ever will figure it out, but I know where my home is. I know where my heart is. And that my home, my larger H home, consists of people. And my people are amazing. And I have a lot of them. And I know that no matter where I go, what I do, that they will be there. Um, You're a solid people collector. Yes. <laughs> Not collector. I don't want to collect but them all. You build Pokemon. community with them. But, um, I mean, like, but, yeah, like, because that's why in, it's that community building that yeah. I can never get away from. Right. And I think that's why I will never go. I shouldn't say never, but I will have a very difficult time being in corporate America. There are just some values that don't sit right with me. Right. There, I don't share those values. Like, you, since your face is so oh honest, yeah, that would be a problem. In corporate America. What is my face saying right now? <laughs> <laughs> Joke anger? (laughs) But you know, so I think that grieving, it's a journey. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that idea of grieving a home that you never had is really complex. And I think also, like, (laughs) I had an idea of, like, what home should be Hmm. and what it could be, but never experiencing that. So I come from, (laughs) I have had many experiences of abuse in my life and I wanted nothing but it all to go away. And so growing up, I did a really good job of finding people that were living the life that I really wanted, that seemed safe, that seemed supportive and loved deeply trying to have a taste of that Mm. but as i've gotten older (laughs) i've come to really understand that everyone is living a fucked up life 
Like people have really like fucked up experiences in that what we often get a chance to see now, this is coming full circle. I was, I, I assumed that people, white people, people w w that were neighbors to my cousins living out in Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, right, Maple Grove, that they were living the life that was desirable, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore my actions towards them in their community, it looked a certain way. Yeah. It's you interesting. Know? You you have all this baggage of people assuming your struggle, <clears throat> and then there's this other weird thing of assuming no struggle when it's all much more nuanced. It really is. It really is. So I think that, yeah, I'm just as guilty as that individual that said those remarks to me, but living it out in my younger days. But what is a child supposed to, what does a child know? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, we're, I mean. But we, but we, but we pick these things up along the way because of the messages that we've been fed, right? That whiter being white is good, being black is not. <laughs> it was funny. I um, was talking to a friend about chocolate. You know, often we, start, you know, you're vanilla, right? <laughs> you're white. You're vanilla. You're, you're you're brown. You're black. You're chocolate. And <laughs> telling her growing up, I really hate it chocolate ice cream. Mm. I hated it. And <laughs> I hated it because I didn't like me. Interesting. I didn't like being black. I didn't like my tone because of all the messages of what it meant to be black and how I was treated, how the different experiences that I had. But on my journey of really loving being black and loving black people and understanding that we have great power and abilities to exist in a world that other folks don't, it's like, whoa. Even though there's a lot of stuff that goes you know, with it of just like straight up and down bullshit, but me coming to really love chocolate ice cream. I like that as a, like, <laughs> you overcame some internalized depression. I did. Through your taste buds. Through my taste buds. <laughs> also, cause, you know, you grow older, you get better taste. Yeah. <laughs> you start to taste. realize, like, I'll give this another chance. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I think that brings us uh, sort of into um, maybe like huge, but what I'll try to have is be sort of our ending little area of focus. Yeah. Because I often, you know, this this whole idea of this project is trying to get some folks to share their experiences that are different than mine and give some folks access to that information. That includes then I'm putting you in a box to have you talk about a certain thing. So okay. that, that happened. And then the other thing that I do is... Another burdening thing is ask how someone like me can help. So like I'm a I'm a white dude. Really? Um, yeah. I don't know if you. I surprise. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know how to tell you. <laughs> um, and I mean, essentially, my question for you is like, how do we dismantle white supremacy? <laughs> really, Levi? <laughs> but we can, but we Come can, on. We can shrink it down. I know. I've just I've been hitting you with like the biggest like capitalism. How do we end that? <laughs> um, <laughs> But, I mean, in smaller ways, but, like, a lot of the stuff you're talking about all comes back to that bigger oppressive idea. We're all being oppressed by the power of sort of cultural whiteness. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing I think there's real value in chipping away at. I see a lot of your work that you're doing in some, so, some direct and some much more abstract ways of dismantling that. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge thing. So what, what do we do to be more engaged in that work. If, if someone hearing you talk about some of these things is sort of some early exposure to them, do you have suggestions of even just lear learning tools for themselves or like what action can somebody take to wanna do something more? And, and not just do more damage. <laughs> Oh, how do you just do something more without doing more damage? I mean, maybe you can't. I mean, maybe that's the answer, too. Um, that would require just being at peace. And oh. you can take that in multiple different ways. <laughs> You're going to tell everyone to go to church, aren't you? <laughs> I, know, I know where this is going. <laughs> I'm not trying to convert you or get you to come to my church. <laughs> even though my church is pretty amazing. There it is. And even that, I had to, like, really... That's been a whole journey, Levi, just yeah. owning that term, Christian. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a whole nother. I don't even want to own it sometimes. Actually, yeah. half the time. Anyways. That's thorny. <laughs> That's too big. Let's just deal with white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> the least fair question. Um, <laughs> so, action step, steps. 
I would say, one, know who you are, know what your values are, and hold those tightly. But being able to be flexible to change and to grow and to develop. Um, knowing that we hold ideas and experiences, right? And we have different viewpoints, but I can only speak from my viewpoint, from my identities. That's my job, right? But understanding that you are going to speak from your, your viewpoint and your identity on this particular subject. Now, how can we engage in a dialogue? How can we engage in community? That's not going to be damaging, right? But that is creating spaces for the seed to grow of doing something different. Also understanding that some of the beliefs that we have aren't, aren't accurate. I'm looking for a better way of saying that. No, they're, um, I, I think they're um, ill-informed. Yeah, they are. Um, but that's hard to, to even realize. Right, right. But you're, but understanding that we're doing the best that we can, yeah. and that's all we can do. So knowing yourself, knowing your values, and holding true to those, but being able to grow along the way and being flexible. I will say know who's in your community and being able to support them as best as possible. So in my community, I have uh, different crews that I roll with um, in which I just need, so I have my, my woman of color crew, right? In which I'm able to, to bear it all. And that space is not meant for anyone else to enter in. That's just my space for me to be. So I can heal, so that I can support, that we can build up, all of that. I have my other communities that I may have different, um, I may be engaging in different ways. But with my larger community, understanding that that is very, that's a mixture of all kinds of ness, people, identities, experiences, right? And when shit happens in our community that is impacting us, it may be impacting, and I say us because if someone is being oppressed, that's it's, that's impacting me. It's my job to help best support them and to do what they're asking me to do, so that we can begin to do something different. So we can begin to tip away at this large barrier of oppression. But that but that requires a, a, a dialogue. And so I think about the the person, the, the man, the, the Asian man on the plane that was dragged, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking. <laughs> I really, really wanted a white person to stand up and say, I, I'll give this man my seat. I'm going to leave. Now, as a saver complex, no, it's to support that. But in the sense of this is bullshit, right? So someone really could have just like did something. Someone could have like walked out. Someone could have did something. But my, th my thought as an ally, as a white ally, it's your job as an accomplice to do what is being asked of you in support of mm -hmm. people of color, of people that are being oppressed. Because if not you, who? You know? Yeah. So know your community, know your role, know what you can offer and what you can't, and speak that out, but being able, to, again, to grow with that. And then lastly, think before you speak. And if you say something horrible, you say something that, that was not on point, <laughs> It's okay. Give, you know, forgive yourself. We're um, in this together sometimes. <laughs> but no, um, but be able to work on yourself with your language and go to a friend and say, hey, I didn't really feel so good about this. What are your thoughts on it? Hmm. How could I have done that differently? And the next time, do your best to do it differently. And on the flip side, call some shit out. So if someone's saying some really fucked up shit, Call it out. Yeah, it feels like the if not you who thing too. Like, if you don't say something, it'll keep going. And often that's the hardest thing. Yeah. Because words are action. They can be action. They're meant to be action in my thought process. So how did I do? That's great. Uh, that's really, I mean, they, they, <clears throat> you did it. It's all dismantled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I honestly could talk to you about a million things, but uh, but I know, we can't, Levi. I know you have a lot of work to do, and I gotta go. Gotta hustle. <laughs> yeah, the hustle doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sleep. So, uh, PH, wh is there places people can connect with you on the internet, like that you would send them to if they want to find ways to build power with you? Oh, is there a best? You don't just, have, just, okay just to shut up, PH in the universe. <laughs> and works. sure someone will respond. <laughs> <laughs> it totally works. <laughs> There's not many, many PHs in uh, Minnesota, no. nope. right? I mean, I've, I've run across one more, but uh, it's kind of questionable. But uh. <laughs> okay, 
that's that's look it. for the the, the 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 rainbow colorful rainbow woman right wearing like decked out in unicorns and horseshoes and mm-hmm. but yeah no i'm on facebook ph copeland <laughs> um also on twitter and instagram the gram I'm sorry, I can't even say that usefully. But yeah, you can find me on Facebook or any other social, social media platform. But if you really are wanting to connect with me, talk to Levi. Yes. Yeah, and uh, we can do tea. Perfect. Uh, but Paige, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you for inviting me, Levi. I hope you have me again. Yeah. We're going to talk about fashion. Ooh. <laughs> Yo, I would love to talk about fashion and like race. That'd be great. Intersection. I love that idea. I would love that. All right. So I, yeah. I can invite a friend, too. <laughs> a fashion friend? Yeah. Season two of Not About You would not be possible without the generous support of Walker West Music Academy in St. Paul. Walker West provides music education to any student who wants to learn, offering a variety of lessons for all ages and all skill levels. Go to walkerwest.org for more information. I wouldn't be able to make Not About You without the deep learning and guidance of folks I've met through my time and the Sustainable Progress Through Engaging Active Citizens program, or SPEAK, based out of Hope Community in Minneapolis. Go to hope-community.org to check out all the amazing work being done at Hope Community. Support them if you've got the resources to do so. Season two of Not About You would absolutely not be possible without all the amazing folks who agreed to be guests and share their valuable time and considerable experience with me. So go seek out their work and find ways to support them. And of course, this show only really has meaning if you listen and share. So thanks for listening. Now go share. Tell someone about the show. Share it on social media with the hashtag NAPOD. Post an iTunes review. Please post an iTunes review. Help me get these conversations out to more folks. The Not About You theme song is Rebels of Our Own Kind by Charlie Van Stee, used with permission from Charlie.